Well, I asked, where's the beef? Let's call this for what this is. Oh my God. <laughs> they are so hopelessly woke. How dare you? <laughs> that is the intellectual capital of the left today. Give me a break. You are now watching the Daily Roundup. As Levant here, I'm at our world headquarters in Toronto. I say world headquarters. It's somewhat audacious. I mean, if you were here, you'd see how modest our territory is, but we are around the world. We have reporters in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and our Melbourne, Australia star, his name is Avi Amini, he just touched down a couple of hours ago in Tel Aviv. Imagine flying to a war zone. Interesting enough, he says the flight he was on was packed that people are going to Israel. You'd think they would be fleeing. I'm sure some are. In fact, I know several hundred are trying to get out and they find the Embassy of Canada of little use. Can you believe it? They, the embassy was closed for Thanksgiving. I mean, hey, we don't want to interrupt your turkey or anything. Um, yeah, how about you guys just come back after the long weekend? Just more malfeasance and uh, incompetence on part of the Liberal government. Um, but I'm excited about our friend Avi going there, and I think he's going to be an excellent reporter. I was just in Israel with Avi a month ago, along with 40 of our most enthusiastic rebel fans. We did a peace tour. We went, we called it the Abraham Accords tour. We started. Do you have that clip that Kean put together, the uh, sort of the uh, montage? Did you see that one, Efron? I want to show people what we did a month ago, and it already feels like ancient history. Um, we called it the Abraham Accords Tour. We did a week in Israel, and then we flew from Tel Aviv over Saudi Arabia in an El Al plane. Think about that. That was illegal until recently. And then we landed in Dubai, and we spent three days in the United Arab Emirates seeing, is this peace deal real? And the answer, my friends, is it is very real. We actually went to a Holocaust museum in Dubai, run by a Muslim Emirati. We went to Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates, where there's an Abraham family uh, friendship center, where there's a church a mosque and a synagogue all on the same campus, all the exact same size and dimensions built by the government. And, and we felt the peace and we felt the friendship. We talked to a Jewish rabbi based in the Emirates who said it's not only peaceful, but he suffers no anti-Semitism as opposed to when he's back in New York, he said, I believed him. And there was this feeling that Saudi Arabia was next to join the peace deal and that maybe it was almost the end of history. And then 
Over a thousand terrorists penetrated the border from Gaza and engaged in the most barbaric terrorism I think anyone has ever witnessed. Um, you know, I was going to play a clip from our trip to Israel, but Efron, I don't even think it's actually necessary, but thank you for looking for it. It was just such a beautiful trip. Actually, if you have it already, let's show it for a bit. Um, and I want to show you because there was sort of a jubilation. We were like it's it was for for most of its existence, Israel has been at war with its Arab neighbors. And to have a peace treaty, not a cold peace as exists between Israel and Egypt or Israel and Jordan, but a warm peace was quite something. And um, it left me hopeful. In fact, it left me feeling somewhat healed. Because what a feeling to go to a Muslim Arab country from Israel and be welcomed, welcome to Dubai. And it was, I, I felt like a lifetime's decades, centuries worth of enmity and animosity were healing. And I think that was just a dream. Here, take a look at this montage that our friend Key and Simone put together. It starts with a clip of a uh, pilgrim from, I think, Mexico, uh, who was singing a little song in Spanish. I think this whole video is, what, about three minutes long? But it gives a, a feeling for what our trip was like, which was a month ago, but given the war, it feels like a hundred years ago. In fact, it feels like a time that never really existed except for in a dreamlike state. Take a look at this clip from our visit to Israel when peace was in the air and security and confidence and happiness and brotherhood were the orders of the day rather than rape, murder, torture, kidnapping, and horror shows. Take a look at this. Journalism here. You see our friend Key and Simone with his camera, and I brought a little camera to take him to So we're going to be doing actual interviews and news reports, but you're going to be right there too, listening to the same people, seeing the same things. And I think that by the end of this trip, I believe that we'll be friends. feel for it. So the video goes on and we go to Arabia and it's amazing to feel the healing. And I don't even want to show any more of the video because it's it's from a, an unserious time, isn't it? And you saw in the background there's some of those fences and border walls and high tech things. Those were all breached. Those have been up there for 20 years, providing peace and security for 20 years. In fact, part of our trip, we met with Danny Tirza, the retired Israeli armed uh, army officer who uh, was in charge of building, planning, directing, designing the wall. I've heard him speak several times before. For 20 years, that wall did the job, but it didn't do the job last weekend. Complacency. A feeling of invulnerability, a feeling that the history was over, 
I was thinking that for those of you who are old enough to remember, when the Berlin Wall came down in 1999 without a shot, like think about it, the Cold War that everyone thought would be ended by a violent thermonuclear war to end all wars, it ended without a shot. <clears throat> it ended because the Soviet Union was exhausted and collapsed. It ended because um, the West outweighted, out earned, outspent the Soviets. And there was a feeling of jubilation. There was a book by Professor Francis Fukuyama called The End of History. We'll all just eat at McDonald's in all our different countries and we'll all watch Disney movies translated into every language and we'll all get along and we'll all trade with each other. We'll all be consumers and customers and, and that's the endless future of happiness is we're all consumers really. And there's no more big battles because the battle between the capitalist West and the Soviet East is now resolved. That was 1989, 1990, the reunification of Germany, the independence of the former Soviet states, but that didn't last forever. Osama bin Laden had other ideas. So did Xi Jinping and other Chinese dictators. So did Vladimir Putin. They all had different ideas about what the future would be like. And I would say that the 90s started in 1989 with the fall of Berlin Wall and ended in 2001 with the fall of the Twin Towers. And I think that the last 20 years in Israel have been that same end of history, 20 years, where the country felt confident. It felt untouchable. It felt inevitable. Yeah, there was this problem in the distance called Iran, and yeah, there were terrorist groups, but it was bearable. It was bearable. It wasn't peace, but it was quiet. And indeed, it looked like peace might well come, but that is ended. And, and our trip to Israel, and thank God we weren't there when the the war, it's a real war. In fact, I see that literally an hour ago, terrorists from the north, from Lebanon, from Hezbollah, different terrorist group, also banned in Canada, by the way, use similar tactics, drones, and light aircraft paragliding. Israel's north is under attack. Anyway, I started this little meander by saying that we're sending one of our top reporters, Avi Yamini, from Melbourne, Australia. He's our chief Australia correspondent. He was with us on that recent trip to Israel, which is what made me think of that. And he just touched down at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv a couple hours ago. And um, I'd like to show you his video filmed on the plane and just getting off the plane. Here, take a look at this. That's a full plane celebrating landing in Israel mid of war. Only in Israel. Well, I've made it to Israel. It's been a long journey, but I'm glad I'm here. And I want to start by thanking each and every one of you that's helping make this possible at thetruthaboutthewar.com. That's where I'll be dropping all the stories and you can help support it, make it possible to cover all the costs associated. Now, before I head to our Airbnb and get ready to go to the front line, I just want to touch on a couple of things that happened on the way here, things that I found fascinating and I think it's important for the world to know. I was expecting an empty flight going into Israel during a war, but to my surprise, when we got on the flight, there wasn't even a single spare seat. And talking to fellow travelers, they were saying it's because either as a family, they don't want to run away from Israel. They want to be in Israel during these dark times with their people and many men were coming back to say they want to serve with their their reserve units and stand and fight for Israel. Something that I don't think you see in many countries. Uh, there's really limited flights out, but you don't see massive lines of people trying to run away. It's just not the attitude here. Just to put it into perspective, look how busy the airport is of people coming now. 
returning to Israel. The other thing I learned on the way here was that Telstra Australia's telco has blocked our site. I don't know why, but for some reason they want to stop people from seeing the other side of the story from this conflict, especially over the next few days and weeks as the narrative changes. The truth about the war.com. We'll post it there and I've already in Dubai briefed lawyers to help us fight Telstra and to ensure that even Australians can get there. But if you can't, make sure to join the mailing list at followrv.com. Uh, I'll send you each story as it comes out as well. But for now, I'll see you on the front line. I um, have mixed feelings about sending Avi there in the middle of a war. It really is a war. And Israel, if you know it on a map, is very narrow. It's fairly long, but it's very narrow. And so those rockets, now the rockets aren't coming from the country of Jordan, but they're coming from the Gaza Strip and Lebanon on top. And so they can pretty much reach the whole country. I mean, uh, Tel Aviv is sort of in the middle of the coast. And you can see, uh, so let's put that map on the screen. Yeah, go ahead. You can see Gaza on the bottom left there. So Gaza, even sort of, quote, homemade rockets from Gaza can hit Ashkelon and sometimes all the way up to Tel Aviv. And then from the north, and the desert, the Negev Desert is fairly uninhabited, but the north also, the Golan Heights, those can be hit by rockets from Syria and Lebanon. So Israel is a very small piece of land. Um, Tel Aviv is its major city, Jerusalem its second city. I, um, sending Avi there, Avi's got his wits about him, he knows the language. He's a former Israel Defense Forces soldier himself, so he knows how to handle himself. He's a veteran. He has friends and family in the country, so he knows how to move around. Right now, we're working on getting him and his cameraman, Benji, a bulletproof vest and a helmet. I understand those bulletproof vests are actually illegal to buy in Canada without a permit. Uh, and of course, Avi's coming from Australia, but I, I understand it's the same there. So Avi is now on the ground in Israel. It's uh, after sunset there now. It's nighttime there now. And Avi will be starting his reporting in earnest tomorrow. Our mission for him is twofold. First of all, to tell the story. But second of all, to tell the story of others telling the story. What I mean by that is to cover the war, but also cover how others are covering the war, cover how the media party is covering the war. Let me give you an example. Uh, Efron, do you have that tweet I did in response to the, that Guardian journalist? The Guardian is a left-wing newspaper. It was called the Manchester Guardian, um, but it's just generally called the Guardian now. And it's a very left-wing paper, extremely woke. Um, Sometimes their headlines are indistinguishable from, uh, you know, the, the Babylon Bee. They're so ridiculous that you don't know if it's a parody or not. Here, let, I can find it. Just search. Oh, you got it there. So I want to show you. This is a real. T I didn't know it was real, but this is a real person. Bethan McKernan. Bethan says, just looked at today's UK front pages and I am horrified by the headlines. Okay, stop right there. So she's horrified, obviously, by what these butchers did, raping, torturing, murdering, hostage taking, right? Is that what has horrified her? No, 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 no. Just looked at today's UK front pages and I'm horrified by the headlines claiming 40 babies beheaded by Hamas in Kafar Aza. Yes, many children were murdered. Yes, there were several beheadings in the attack. This claim, however, is unverified and totally irresponsible. No, it's actually verified, sister. And uh, it's true. Not all 40 of the babies were beheaded. Your point taken. Uh, most of them were just murdered the regular way. 
And I wrote, the Guardian newspaper wants you to know there's a right way and a wrong way to murder babies. And she's absolutely horrified, you should know, that newspapers would get it wrong. I mean, why are you defaming Hamas? Why? I mean, she should do a fact check. Fact check, false. No, 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 no. Only some of the babies were beheaded. The rest were just shot or had their throats slashed or whatever. This Guardian reporter wants you to know that the newspapers got it wrong. That, I swear that's real. That, I, I didn't believe it. That is a real reporter for the Guardian. But we saw the other day uh, a memo from the CBC leaked, but it didn't need to leak. It wasn't a secret memo to begin with. The CBC will tell you if you ask them. They refuse to use the word terrorist. They have a policy. The CBC, along with CTV, apparently, along with the Associated Press, along with Reuters, they all have the same policy. They do not use the word terrorist ever unless they are quoting someone else saying the word. So if someone else says the terrorist group Hamas and they're quoting that person, they won't edit the, the person's quote. But they themselves will never say it. Because that would be to take sides, you see. <laughs> I mean, imagine applying that to other situations. An arsonist. No, 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 no. No, um, th that's being too blamish, too blamey. We'll let the prosecutors and the firemen call him an arsonist, but we'll just call him a fire uh, p positive person or something. Oh, the murderer. No, 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 no. I mean, he's confessed. We have him on videotape. He, no, no, no. He is a, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm just trying to think of any other situation where someone is something, but you don't say, and they say they're that. And by the way, I don't know if you know this. Can you Google this? Google Canada terrorist list. And it should pop up. Canada's Department of uh, Public Security, that's our version of the homeland. Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah, put that, if you Google, it's on Public Safety Canada. That's our version of the Homeland Security. This, as you can see, Government Canada website, currently listed entities. Pump it up a little bit for my old eyes. There you go. Uh, several listed entities, da, da, da. So these are currently listed entities. These are the banned terrorist groups in Canada. And um, there are some from certain places, but you can detect a bit of a theme here. A little bit of a theme. There's Hamas, uh, Harakat. Al there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, Islamic State. There's a lot of different Islamic State terrorist groups. It's just almost a whole page. Um, yeah, there's one or two. But um, there's the Tamil Tigers. There's the, Pal there's the Palestinians. I, I chuckle. I shouldn't laugh, but they put the Proud Boys on there. Um, the Proud Boys have had one event in Canada about five years ago when several Canadian forces, Proud Boys, including a gay man and an indigenous man, went on Canada Day to stand up for the Canadian flag. That was the only time that Proud Boys did anything in Canada. And um, Trudeau put them on the list because he wanted to show it wasn't just left-wingers and it wasn't just Islamic extremists. But uh, there's the Taliban. Um, thanks very much. What I wanted to show you there I, I talked a lot about that page, but what, I, but what I wanted to show you, and I did show you, is that Hamas is on that list. So it's actually not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of um, what he says and she says and split it down the middle. It is a matter of fact, and it is a matter of law, that Hamas is a terrorist group. It is, and I know that because it is on the official list. It is on the list not just of Canada, but of many other countries, including other countries in the Arab and Muslim world. And yet the CBC and CTV and Associated Press and Canadian Press will not call them terrorists unless they're forced to because someone else is saying that and they're quoting that someone else. I saw... A tweet, I don't know if you can find it, Efron, I'm making you find so many things on the go. But I saw a tweet from, uh, about the New York Times. The New York Times accidentally used the word terrorist. 
and they changed the story to remove it. I am not making that up. I don't know if you can find that, Efron. I, I, oh, yeah, you got it. I can't believe you found it so quickly. Take, take a look at this. So here is version one, Hamas leaves trail of terror in Israel, blah, 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 massacre of civilians by Hamas terrorists. So that was version one. You see it says Hamas terrorists? <laughs> Hamas leaves trail of terror in Israel, the massacre of civilians by Hamas gunmen. You can't call them, and by the way, they weren't all gunmen. This is actually less accurate because some killed by beheading babies. Some killed by burning their victims. Um, some took hostages, and we will only find out what absolutely degraded barbarity uh, is yet to emerge. The New York Times literally made their story less accurate. But God forbid they should call Hamas terrorists. It would hurt their feelings, and that Guardian reporter would be horrified. Uh, I don't think she used the word horrified to describe the horrifying things that these terrorists did. She was horrified for them. And so one of the purposes of Avi's trip to Israel is not just to report on the war, but to report on the reporting of the war and to point out things like I just showed you. Uh, it's 1.26 Eastern time. It's a pleasure to be in this seat. Normally my friends Sheila Gunn-Reed and David Menzies are here. We have other rebel personalities who cycle through. Um, I want to show you... Uh, well, we've got so many videos from across the country of what's going on in Canada, because while Avi is in Israel, and he'll be doing journalism on the ground with our videographer, Benji, there's an important story or series of stories here in Canada. Let me list some for you. We have Hamas terrorist supporters in Canada. And, and we know this because there are huge rallies of them. And they say things like intifada, which means pogrom, riot. They wave signs. I saw a sign with Saddam Hussein in it. Was that in Canada or was, where was, was that in Mississauga? I mean, who even has that, like a poster size? Like it was probably hanging on their wall or something in their dining room or maybe on the roof of the ceiling of their bedroom, I don't know. Who has a large framed photo of Saddam Hussein just handy, just waiting for the, yeah, that's it there, put that on the screen. I can't even believe, like who has that? I think it's right at the beginning of that. Yeah, freeze it when, he, when, when Saddam makes a, a cameo. Yeah, I think that's Saddam Hussein. Who has that just handy? Like, you can't just print that. That's, that's 11 by 17, or, or that's even bigger. That, that's like some people have, you know, you go to a cameraman, everyone dresses nice, and uh, the family portrait session, you, you know, the kids are all squirmy, and the adults are saying, come back here and smile, come on, we'll get through this, kids. You know, family portrait day. I don't know if they still do that, because everyone has their selfie cameras all the time, but it used to be a thing before smartphones, that so you went and you had your family portrait taken maybe once every few years, and you hung that in the house on the wall as sort of this is our family looking its best. It was a thing that people did. Um, but this family, instead of that, uh, has Saddam uh, <laughs> Hussein on the wall in Mississauga, and why not bring it out for a Hamas rally? You'll fit right in. You'll be old school. So you got your new school terrorists like Hamas, and you got your old school. You got your old, oh, what you got there? Some, uh, <laughs> you got some NWA? You got some, what are the real old school? I mean, some people call Beastie Boys old school. I would. No, 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 no. Saddam Hussein, that's the real goat. Who, who, who are these people? And they are here by the thousand. So they chant intifada, which means riot or pogrom. They chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And if you look at a map, and we showed you the map, the eastern border of Israel is the river, the River Jordan, and the western border is the sea. So when they say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, uh, they're talking about removing in its entirety the state of Israel. Now, there are more than 20 Arab states and probably more than 30 Muslim states in the world, but there is only one Jewish state in the world. And as luck would have it, the um, pro-Hamas protesters 
want to remove it from the river to the sea. And what they did last weekend to a thousand Jews murdering them, they have 200 hostages at least, 2,000 injured, the most violence suffered by Jews since the Holocaust. Um, they want to do that again and again and again and again and again and again till Israel is, as Hitler would say, Judenrein. That's the German word for from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Now, what's that clip we're looking at there right now? That's, that is at Gaza Plaza, am I right? In That's in Mississauga, Saturday night, having a little Hamas party. And by the way, Olivia Chow <clears throat> said, our police are going to arrest people for hate speech. Don't lie. First of all, I don't think the police would have the courage to wade into that crowd and try and arrest anyone. They would be lynched. Um, and second of all, I don't think they have the instructions to arrest anyone. I'm not even talking for hate speech. I've never been a fan of hate speech offenses. I'm talking about the criminal code provisions against supporting terrorist groups. You don't have to be hateful to be a criminal. Yeah, here's what Olivia Chow uh, posted to the internet. I'm aware of the unsanctioned rally at Nathan Phillips Square today. My statement below. I remember Nathan Phillips Square when our, us rebels went there to do some news journalism and we were told you cannot be there. Police will kick you off. It's a public plaza in front of City Hall. We weren't holding a rally or anything. We were just doing news and City Hall tried to kick us off and we, we took a bit of a stand. This is an actual pro-Hamas rally. Oh, it's, it's not sanctioned. Are you going to do anything about it, sister? Yeah, I'm going to tweet. But here's what she tweeted. The government of Canada has rightly listed Hamas as a terrorist organization, and we simply must not tolerate any support of terror, full stop. But she doesn't stop. She says the rally is to support Hamas, and Nathan Phillips Square today is unsanctioned, without a permit, and I unequivocally denounce it. So you'll do everything except for stopping it. Got it. Glorifying this weekend's indiscriminate violence, including murder and the kidnapping of women and children by Hamas against Israel civilians is deplorable. Okay, and I accept that you've deplored it, but you haven't stopped the, the terrorist rally outside your office window. I am receiving updates from the chief of police who assures me they will investigate and address any suspected incidents of hate. Well, the, old, the whole thing is an incident of hate, sister. Because the whole project of Hamas is based on hating not just Israel, but Jews. And they say this. They don't, they don't say um, attack Israel. Sometimes they do. They don't even like using the word Israel. They say attack the Jews, kill the Jews. And you'll see that her instructions were to get them for hate speech. Well, of course, they didn't do that. But the criminal code provisions of terrorism go to any form of support. You don't have to be full of a particular emotion to be, to be convicted of the crime of supporting terrorism. So, of course, there are no charges laid. Do you think Olivia Chow, a woman of the hard left, is going to arrest her voter base? <laughs> what do you got there, Efron? Let's take a look. Here's her deleted tweet. Let's take a look. Uh, can you zoom in just a little bit? My earlier tweets on this have been deleted because of the harm and confusion they caused. Okay, I, if you can find her earlier tweets, we'll, we'll have a look at them. But they're actually not that important. Well, they are important, but they're not critical to our conversation at this exact moment. Um... It's interesting right now because, you know what, I've been aware of this for a long time, and maybe I'd be more attentive to it than most because uh, my life was put on a particular course, I don't know, almost 20 years ago when as the publisher of the Western Standard Magazine, I, I did a modest, non-clickbaity story. This was in the era before the Internet was ubiquitous. It was 2006, February. We published in a print magazine uh, eight of the Danish cartoons of Mohammed, and we just talked about censorship and and how some Muslims hold that you can depict Islam. We had we had a little uh, mosaic by some Shiite Muslims depicting Mohammed. Our point was, 
not all Muslims say you can't depict Muhammad. And we just show, it was just, a, it was sort of a brainy discussion more than anything lascivious. And yet I was prosecuted for three years by the Alberta Human Rights Commission. And I was put on a particular course in life where I realized the threat to our secular rule of law, um, this human rights law was being transformed into kind of a blasphemy law. And we didn't have, we had heard for years about the separation of church and state, but we hadn't really heard much about the separation of mosque and state. And so I was hauled before this Human Rights Commission um, by a secular prosecutor, a secular investigator, who was really running an errand for someone who said, I, I challenged the Koran. And I was put through that process for three years. So my eyes were opened to these issues and the fact that you had a very irredentist, very hardcore Islamic extremist base in the country. Then you had some Islamists who weren't really motivated by that. They were, you know, doing other things, running a business, making money, living life. But they were maybe supportive a little bit. And then you had this core of bureaucrats and activists, almost all of them white, who took up the cause of radical Islam because it was anything to destroy the center, anything to destroy the establishment. And we've just got to destroy Canada. We've got to tear down John A. Macdonald. We've got to tear down the Western concepts of law, Western concepts of meritocracy, destroy Canada, raise it to the ground and we'll rebuild it. And there was a bit of a conflict there because of course, Jihadists would want to rebuild it in the image of an Islamic state, whereas the woke would want to rebuild it as some communist utopia. And so they would certainly quarrel after it was done, but in the meantime, they were allies in destroying the establishment. And I saw this 15, 20 years ago, and it's so evident now. I want to show you such a weird guy. Show me the weird picture of Fred Hahn. Now, I'm not really into Ontario politics. I'm just not. <laughs> Look at this guy. Look at this guy. That almost looks like it's like, like who is that guy? Is that a real, they almost look it's a, like it's a plastic mask, doesn't it? Like the shock of hair and the glasses and, and that enormous rictus grin and the tongue. You know who else sticks out his tongue like that? It's Justin Trudeau. Am I right? Yeah. He got, you know what? He stuck out his tongue like that when, when the new Speaker of the House was impaneled. What's with that? It's that's weird. And yeah, that's a real face. That photo is not all. Does that photo not look digitally altered? I know. I, that, is, that is from his own social media account. That's what, so who is this? He looks like a kind of scary clown. Like that's not a happy clown. That's not a sad clown. That's not a funny clown. That's not a goofy clown. That's a scary clown. But look behind that scary clown. Do you see that just over his shoulder there? That's Che Guevara. And uh, I don't know if you know this, Che Guevara, gay rights. <laughs> yeah, uh, no such thing. Um, you know, just Google it. I, I'm just going to, I just ticked in, I just typed in Che Guevara, gay rights. And an enormous number of hits come up. Um, I'm looking at one right now. He, he said he would kill people with regard to, without regard to, to uh, guilt or innocence, but in his diaries, he wrote of a man who, quote, apart from being homosexual and a first-rate bore, had been very nice to us, um, but, but he goes on about killing gays. Now, he was obviously racist. Um, he, was a, he was really, I'm not going to get into some of the grossness, but my point is that Che Guevara might have killed Fred Hahn for being gay. Obviously, we'll never know. I think if Che Guevara had encountered someone who looked and acted so over the top like Fred Hahn, I think Che Guevara would have killed him because he didn't like gays. He just didn't. 
Yeah. I mean, wh what's the source of that? Human progress. Che Guevara. Yeah, put that on the screen for a second. Che was a racist, homophobe, and mass murderer. Yeah, shocked. I'm shocked that that a communist uh, revolutionary uh, isn't dainty. Yeah, he was a racist, homophobe, and a mass murderer. You can get the details for yourself. But there's something to what I just said about how radical Islam has found common cause with the woke left, even though they would be at odds with each other in the final battle. They both have this immediate battle against our society. And so Fred Hahn, who is the head of QP Ontario, which stands for the Canadian Union of Public Employees, so it's an enormous union. I think there's 300,000 members of his union in Ontario alone. He started tweeting when the images were fresh of rape and murder and torture and kidnapping. He started tweeting his support. His support for the terrorists. Palestine is rising. Long live the resistance. And this image here is juxtaposed with one of the rape and murder victims being humiliated. That's her dead body being humiliated and uh, the dead body being attacked by Hamas extremists in Gaza. So you have a, a gay activist, labor activist, who has a picture of Che Guevara on the wall and who would have his throat slit in a second. They throw gay people off of apartment buildings in Gaza. Gaza is a Sharia law totalitarian dictatorship. It's not a liberal democracy. This guy, Fred Hahn, and, and he's doubled down and doubled down again. And, he's, <laughs> and then when he got an earful, on, on social media, yeah, yeah, let's throw some of these tweets. He started saying, oh, it's the Jews. The Jews are coming to get me. Oh, for anyone to imagine I would ever endorse violence is horrific to me. I, ca I can't believe, I'm shocked. It speaks volumes about the times we're in. I've spent my adult life fighting for justice for workers, building power and solidarity for working people to resist, to win better. Really? What's that got to do with you cheering rapists? You cheering murderers? These are deeply tragic and troubling days. Today's a call on all of us to be clear, so let me be clear. I've never celebrated violence. You did over the weekend, you wicked liar. Hoping for people to be free is not violence. Criticism of governments who misuse the power of people is not violence. You wicked liar. We all saw you. We all saw you cheer, cheer, and retweet and repost your support for the terrorists. I see that he was condemned by Ontario Premier Doug Ford. I think the left has a really deep problem. They have another MLA, I don't, or MPP as they're called in Ontario. I think her name is Sarah Jama. Do you want to call up Sarah Jama? Am I getting that name right? Like I say, I'm not a close follower of the NDP, really. Why would you? There she is. And we got a little website there called Fire Gemma, J-A-M-A. -A. Let's read this. Pump it up for my old eyes. Ontario NDP member of the provincial parliament makes abhorrent comments sympathetic towards Hamas. Sarah Jamma, a first-term MPP, demanded Israel, quote, end all occupation of Palestinian land and end apartheid. I don't know if Sarah Jamma knows this, but Israel actually left Gaza in the year 2005, which by my math is 18 years ago. There is not a single Israeli office or there's not a single Jew. They literally removed all the Jews who were living there. They literally dug up the graveyards of the Jews and removed the dead bodies. They did that so they wouldn't be desecrated by Hamas. There's not a single Jew in Gaza. Well, now there is because the, the Israeli army is going in. Let me read this. And Ontario NDP MPP is again in hot water after making controversial comments regarding the Hamas terrorist attack in Israel on October 7. Sarah Jama, first turned MPP, released a statement on the deteriorating conditions. Let's click that. Let's read that statement. 
Um, there we go. Do we have her actual tweet? Oh, no, this is her statement where she says, uh, yeah, she's been digging a whole more and more also. Um, it got so bad that her NDP leader in Ontario, and I got to tell you this, I'm a bit of a news hound. All I do is read the news. I'm glued to my Twitter. I got a serious Twitter addiction. I read the news all the time. I got emails. I talk to people. I'm news, news, news. I have a news show, news, news, news. I can't tell you the name of Ontario's NDP leader because why would I be interested in the trivial pursuit of that? That's an answer to a trivia question. Hey, Ezra, who's the leader of the Ontario N NDP? I don't know. Who's the leader of like the fifth place party in uh, South Korea? Why, why would I know? Why would I care? Um, so she, she put out this call for an immediate ceasefire, basically blaming the Jewish victims. And she said, I'm reflecting on my role as a politician who's participating in this settler colonial system. And I asked that all politicians do the same. Free Palestine. She got to spell it right. Well, sister, if you are a settler, why don't you go back to where you're from if you're a colonialist? But she has been called upon. It's sort of funny. The Trivial Pursuit answer of who the leader of the NDP is is unbeknownst to me. But she called upon Sarah Jama to retract which is a weird thing because Sarah Gemma obviously believes this. This isn't her first anti-Semitic outburst. I mean, she's a new Democrat MPP. It's shorter to list the friends of the Jews in that party than those with pro-Hamas outbursts. So the leader has certainly not asked Sarah Gemma to change her mind. She knows she won't. Or even to apologize. She knows she won't. Just can you please take that down? Can you please delete that? Can you please? Hi, I'm your NDP leader. Can you please delete this deeply troubling post where you're siding with the terrorists against women who were tortured and raped and murdered? And can you check? Has she taken anything down as of yet? Uh, right we're checking right now. Feel free to put that on the screen and we'll watch you search in real time. I don't think she's taken it down, has she? There it is, right? Yep. And you just loaded that a second ago. So there you have it, Sarah Jama. It's having a little bit of a rebellion, a little bit of an intifada, a peaceful intifada against her own party because they're not anti-Israel enough for her. Be interesting to see how that ends. I wonder if she'll join the Greens or maybe she'll start the Hamas party. Why not? I mean... Toronto police, Peel Region police, they didn't um, arrest anybody at the actual Hamas rallies. So why would they arrest Sarah Jam if she started the Hamas party? She could be the leader of it. I can't remember, was she wearing some abaya or hijab or something? She's half dressed for it. I don't know if they allow women to be politicians in Hamas. I don't think so even if they are covered. I just don't think they allow women to lead. So maybe she'll have to have a different party than the Hamas party. But really, why not? I mean, the police are not arresting Hamas activists in Canada. She could, you know, I mean, she could make headlines as the first Hamas elected politician in North America. She'd certainly get a lot of financial election donations. Hey, it's 1.48. I've been going full tilt for 48 minutes. We're just going to take a very short break. I want to invite you to a couple of fun things we got going on. Do we have a cruise ad? Do we have... Okay. We've got a few things going on I'd like to invite you to, including, if you can believe it, like I just told you about this trip we did to Israel. We, that, that was very safe at the time. I wouldn't recommend going on a tourist trip to Israel necessarily right now. But we are going on a cruise sailing out of Fort Lauderdale in March. And we're inviting our most enthusiastic viewers to come along with us. Here's a little ad of that. It's summertime now. But the cold Canadian winter will be here soon enough. So I am planning a week-long Caribbean cruise in March with your favorite Rebel News personalities, including myself, Sheila Gunn-Reed, Alexa Lavoie, David Menzies, and many more, plus the woman of the year, Tamara Leach. Want to come with us? 
We're going to sail out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida on March 23rd. Our first stop will be the beautiful Half Moon Key in the Bahamas, then on to Ocho Rios, Jamaica, then the Cayman Islands, and finally Cozumel, Mexico. Talk about a great winter getaway. It's going to be beautiful and relaxing and a little bit luxurious. We're going on Holland America Line, so you know it's going to be good. But the real fun is that we're bringing some of the most interesting thinkers and doers on the cruise with us for a series of special Rebel News only events on the cruise ship when we're at sea, including panel discussions where you can get intimate and interactive with some of the smartest public policy minds around. It's not just Rebel News staff, it's newsmakers we love to interview on our shows. That's what makes this cruise so special. Over the course of the week, you'll have countless opportunities to talk one-on-one -on -one with your favorite Rebel News personalities in a casual setting. We'll have private Rebel News only receptions and a series of panel discussions with a question and answer session where you can really dig into the issues. And this is my favorite part. Every night, we're gonna have dinner together and we're gonna rotate tables at dinner each night so you'll be with a different Rebel celebrity uh, every night. And your fellow rebel enthusiasts. So, for example, one night you'll have dinner with me, the next night you'll have dinner at Tamara Leach's table, and so on. How much fun is that? I can hardly wait. If you like cruising already, well, this is truly something unique. And if you've never been on a cruise ship before, this is the perfect way to start with a group of like-minded rebels from coast to coast. You can find out all the details, including the different cabin prices at rebelnewscruise.com. I know you're gonna look back on it as the vacation of a lifetime. We've reserved a limited number of Rebel News cabins, so book yours today at rebelnewscruise.com. We'll see you there. Come on out November 25th, it's all aboard the Freedom Train in Niagara-on-the-Lake. You can check Rebel News for updates and also the Freedom Passport site. Tamara Leach, who led the Truckers Convoy, will be sharing the stage with some of the finest international recording artists. Like the Chops Horns from New York City, who's played with Alicia Keys, Stevie Wonder, the Rolling Stones, and many more. Plus New World Sun, just off a European tour. And the legendary R&B master, Leroy Emanuel. Get on the Freedom Train with Tamara Leach. Saturday, November 25th at Niagara on the Lake Central Community Center, 680 York Road. Get your tickets today at freedompassport.ca. The Freedom Train is coming. Know your rights. Know your freedoms. Hey, Ben Shapiro here. This November, the Wilberforce Project is bringing me to Canada. If you want to fight the woke machine destroying families, join me in Calgary for my talk, hosted by the Wilberforce Project. Go to benshapirolive.ca for info and tickets. Hey, I'm back. You know, I think I'm going to do the live stream all week. So I'll do it Thursday and Friday, and we'll see what next week holds. I've got a lot of things to say, and I can't fit it all in my monologues um, and my interviews. And I'm not traveling. I've been traveling a lot lately. Hey, there have been some amazing super chats. I'm going to go through those. So thank you, and thanks for your patience. Fraser McBurney, who I've had the pleasure to meet, and we actually had dinner together at a Chinese restaurant uh, last year, I guess it was. Um, Chips in 100 bucks and says, I'm proud to donate $100 to help fund Avi and Benji go to Israel to tell the truth. Well, thank you very much. And they are on the ground, I'm pleased to report. Uh, Judah Bercy, five bucks. Biblical prophecies are coming to fruition. God with his people will be winners in the end. I sure hope you're right. Five bucks, rabid RO4, say, rabid roach. The one positive I can extract from the war in Israel is that the world is going, getting to watch the world's news sources and advocacy organizations thoroughly discredit themselves. Well, you have to know, you have to be savvy. For example, most people wouldn't have detected that the New York Times changed the word terrorist to gunman, right? So I, I think for most casual news consumers, they won't know that. Um, Alberta Dawn, five bucks. How long until there are terror attacks in Western countries to protest Israel defending their country from a terrorist attack? Well, we've already had terrorist attacks in the West, haven't we? I mean, 9-11 obviously being the most stunning and staggering. The Brits had their had many terrorist attacks. Uh, an Ariana Grande, Ariana Grande concert was attacked. I believe that was in Manchester. They had their, their subway bombings. I think they had a bus bombing. Of course, in Canada, 
Uh, we had the murder of Nathan Cirillo and the storming of Parliament. Thank God no one in Parliament was, was uh, killed. And um, there's many terror plots, such as the Millennium Bomber who drove from B.C. into Washington State and thankfully was caught. In the United States, there's terror attacks quite frequently, and I'm, or I, let me take that back, not frequently, but not, it's not rare anymore, and I'm deeply worried about their massive open border. If Iran had been planning and scheming how to get over and under and through Israel's wall for years, well, all they would have to do is watch Twitter and know they could just walk through America's undefended border. Just walk through. I'm worried what's coming in America. It's 1.55 p.m. I'm going to wrap up at the top of the hour. I want to end with some surprising good news. It's not important news, but it, it's small news, but it's good news. I'm going to show you two tweets that surprised me. Because I think the Democrats are the party of Hamas. I don't think I'm saying anything controversial by that. In Canada, the NDP is the party of Hamas. In fact, can you go to fire... We just said, we just found, <laughs> we told you fire jammer, right? Well, there's an NDP MLA in Alberta named Lizette Tejada. Can you go to fire Lizette? Alberta NDP MLA says Israelis are barbarians. They're the ones guilty of genocide, not, not the Hamas terrorists raping, murdering, stabbing, beheading their way through civilian homes. It's the Jews who are the barbarians. They're the ones guilty of genocide. And uh, so we've got a little petition there at Fire Lizette. So I think the NDP is a bit of an anti-Semitism problem. And if you're not Jewish, I don't think you're out the hook because I think they have a bit of a terrorism problem. And, w and one thing we've learned over the last few days, it, although Jews were probably 90% of the murdered, uh, murder victims, uh, there were others. I, I read there were 15 Thai workers um, from Thailand who were murdered as well. Um, I saw there were some Arab Israelis who were mur murdered as well. Um, and as 9-11 shows, America, North America is not safe. And do you think that if Israel were wiped off the map, do you think they'd say, all right, we're done? Do you think that would happen? And by the way, what do you think of all these people in North America chanting intifada, chanting death to the Jews, or as they said in Sydney, gas the Jews. Do you think, you think they're suddenly going to become liberal Democrats, gentle people? So yeah, I don't think it's just a Jewish problem. The Jews are the canary in the coal mine. They're the first to go. Ha, <laughs> Fred Hahn, that, that bizarre, scary clown. He thinks he's going to be spared. They're going to butcher him. They're going to throw him off the top of a tower. In Iran, they execute gays by hanging. In Saudi Arabia, they occasionally use stoning and they have beheading. In the Gaza Strip, it's typically throw them off the top of a tower, like an apartment building. Scary clown Fred Hahn thinks he's going to be spared. But why does the NDP support this? Well, I think it's easy for them to hate Jews. But they want to destroy the establishment. They want to bring it all down. And anyway, let me read to you in closing uh, two tweets from two Democrats that surprised me because the Democrats in the U.S. are the party of Hamas. We know that. They made that choice. Weirdly, Jews continue to vote for the Democrats. I find that really weird. It's like that old joke, chickens for Colonel Sanders. Woo! Yeah, you're going to wind up dead, brother. But two uh, ex-presidents weighed in, and I have to say I was, I was a little bit surprised. The first was Barack Obama. Now, I'm not sure if he believes this or means this, but he said it, and it's had close to 70 million views in America and around the world. Barack Obama on Monday said all Americans should be horrified and outraged by the brazen terrorist attacks on Israel and the slaughter of innocent civilians, period. We grieve for those who died, pray for the safe return of those who have been held hostage, and stand squarely alongside our ally, Israel, as it dismantles Hamas. That's a very interesting thing. So 
It's easy to say I'm against butchering women and children, although a lot of new Democrats and Democrats down there find it difficult, but to say stand squarely alongside our ally Israel as it dismantles Hamas. So that goes further and says Hamas should be, could be, will be destroyed. That's, that's further than I thought Barack Obama would go. And then he says, as we support Israel's right to defend itself against terror, we must keep striving for a just and lasting peace for Israelis and Palestinians alike. And I, I can't disagree with that. So he's not doing, I don't think he's doing on the one hand, on the other hand, ism. I don't think he's saying, well, you Jews had it coming. I don't, he's just saying, by the way, let's keep trying to have a just and lasting peace. I, I actually think that is a better statement than 90% of Democrats, don't you? I was surprised by that. I don't think his foreign policy reflected that, but that's what he said, and 70 million people read it. And then Jeffrey Epstein's friend, what's his name again? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, um, he made a tweet also that was pretty good too. Listen, credit where it's due, right? He said, as the atrocities committed by Hamas become ever more horrifyingly clear, it can seem too painful to endure, but we cannot and should not allow ourselves to look away. These grotesque crimes were designed to dehumanize and desensitize. We owe it to the victims to bear witness so that we can unite against terror and do everything we can to ensure this is never repeated. It's a emotion, more emotional response, and I think he's right, don't look away. He's not as clear about standing with Israel as it dismantles Hamas, but in a way, it's more emotionally uh, supportive, if not as practical. Credit where it's due. Credit where it's due. The hour goes by quickly. It's 2.01. I thank you for those who've been watching on Rumble and our various other streams. It makes me chuckle that we start our live stream with the disclaimer for YouTube saying, hey, we might some, say some unapproved things about COVID. What a laugh the mainstream media is and the big tech platforms. They're lying to you. They lie like a rug. I, we showed you that classic lie of how they will not say the word terrorist. I see the European Union is now threatening Elon Musk saying he'd better censor these images. Does the European Union care that people are seeing atrocities? Mm, maybe. I think what they care is that they're seeing atrocities uh, done by Hamas. I haven't seen the European Union weigh in to stop Twitter users from showing um, victims of Russian military collateral damage because the European Union doesn't like Russia. But they're squawking that Hamas is being expo exposed as terrorists. And they're saying to Elon Musk, you better stop letting people see those things. They're only allowed to see what we want them to see. And the Guardian is there to tell them, look, not all those babies who were murdered were beheaded. Only some of them were beheaded. And I'm horrified. She said horrified. She was horrified that Hamas would be getting bad press like that. Well, my friends, it's 2.03 Eastern time. I'll have my own monologue uh, tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. Join in. You can get uh, that for free as a podcast in audio format. Or to see the video version, you can go to rebelnewsplus.com. It's eight bucks a month. You get the video version of the show. But more importantly, you help Rebel News stay strong because we do not take a dime in government money, and it shows. There's just no way that a company like ours could say what we say if we were on Trudeau's teat, like the CBC, like CTV, like the Globe and Mail, like the Toronto Star, like Post Media. We just are freer than them because we're 100% viewer supported. That's our live stream for the day. Until tonight, on behalf of all of us here at Rebel World Headquarters, to you at home, goodbye, and keep fighting for freedom.